hear the really good word of the Lord this morning. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat down on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead. <laughs> and indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, and he says to us today, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers and sisters to go to Galilee there they will see me. This is the really good word of the Lord. Amen. Whew. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified on Good Friday and then raised to new life three days later. Is anybody surprised to hear that today? Did you not know what you came to hear today? Anybody surprised to hear that Jesus died and was resurrected? It's, it's hard to surprise folks on Easter Sunday anymore, you know? I imagine the first Easter Sunday, this was really shocking stuff. Like really, truly surprising. My very first boss used to say to me, Shauna, amaze me. Don't surprise me. You get it, right? He's a little bit of a control freak, uh, and not everyone likes surprises. Surprises can be a little bit of a mixed bag. He was the kind of guy that did not like surprises because it meant that something was going to happen that he did not expect, that he did not orchestrate, and he did not see coming. And so he was fine if you amazed him, but don't surprise him. Are you someone who doesn't like to be surprised? So I, I want you to take a, a look at a video of our son, Callan. This is used with his permission, by the way. Um, we have a deal in our household. If I tell a story about one of the kids, or if Tim tells a story about one of the kids, they get a dollar for a story. <laughs> but this is a video, and this is Easter. So Callan actually negotiated with me, and this is a $5 video. <laughs> <laughs> you're about to see <laughs> his very first car wash. my beating heart. So, okay, I won't embarrass him anymore. What I don't know if you could hear at the very end was he asked, Dugan? 
right? So like he was terrified at first, cried a little bit when he went through the car wash, but then at the end realized like, hey, this was kind of cool. Let's do it again. Surprise! He liked the car wash. We love a good surprise, right? I, I, we, we do really love a good surprise. There is a whole field of writers who write for novels and movies that have worked out all the tactics and techniques to surprise us. Now, we, we want the ending that we want. We want the ending to end the way that we want. We just want to be surprised as to how they get there, right? Like, we, we really want to be amazed and not surprised. <laughs> So there's a whole genre of writers who know just how to write the perfect plot twist. And so whether it means that, you know, she really has a twin or he's really the father, it was a dream after all, I see dead people, whatever it is, we want to be surprised. Well, sort of, as long as we get the ending that we want to get. We really want to be more amazed than surprised. I, I think that's because, uh, yeah, a really good surprise uh, needs, to, needs to be truly surprising. Like my boss, we don't want to be really surprised by the outcome, only by the way that it happens. The women were filled with fear and great joy. They were filled with fear and great joy. They were genuinely, truly surprised. They did not see this coming. Jesus is truly surprising. I mean, the truly surprising. Can I ask you a question? Are you afraid of Jesus? Maybe just a little bit. If I can be honest with you, I'm a little bit afraid of Jesus sometimes. I mean, just, just a little bit. I, I'm a little bit afraid. I know that's not the kind of thing we want to talk about on Easter. Easter, we do a really good job with the celebration of the great joy part. And we don't talk so much about the little bit of fear. We do a great job with Easter baskets and good music, great music, nice clothes. You all look so lovely today. Easter baskets, and there's going to be egg hunts after service. We do a great job with the great joy part. And that's good and right. I mean, after all, Good Friday was scary enough. We want to come to Easter Sunday morning and hear, He is risen. He is risen indeed. There is nothing more to fear. The last enemy of death has been conquered. Do not be afraid. Amen. And that is good and right for us to hear today. So why am I still a little bit afraid of this guy? I mean, a little, just a little bit. A little bit afraid to let him so shape my life that my life might be so patterned after this Jesus guy that I come to trust in God to raise me up to new life rather than trying to orchestrate it for myself. Just a little bit afraid of what that might look like, that it might have an ending that I didn't plan, an outcome that I didn't orchestrate, like just a little bit afraid. People have always been afraid of Jesus before, though. I mean, he's he's used to this. People have always been afraid of Jesus. Poor guy. I mean, he was just a baby when Herod tried to kill him. The devil was so afraid of him, tried to tempt him. And then he goes around healing sick people, feeding hungry people, and sharing good news with people, and everyone's trying to kill him. I hear that that is what raising teenagers is like. I would not know that (laughs) yet. People have been afraid of Jesus for a really long time. People are afraid of someone who is truly surprising. Jesus came to be king, but surprise, not the kind of king you expected. A king who turns everything we think we know about power and authority on its head. He wasn't born in a palace, he was born in a stable. He didn't come in a war horse, he came in on a donkey. He didn't come to gain esteem of the rich and the powerful, but to give the kingdom to the poor and the powerless. And he wasn't lifted up on a throne, he was lifted up on a cross. I'm sure the ruling class of the day would have been perfectly fine 
if Jesus had come in and amazed them with his wisdom and his strength, maybe even his generosity and his kindness, that would have been fine. But this king is too surprising. This kind of kingdom, this kind of surprise, it's the surprise that changes the ending, that takes things out of our control, and a lot of people don't like that. Myself included sometimes. Even after they killed him, they were afraid of him. Isn't that wild? Even after the crucifixion, they were so afraid of him, the authorities did everything that they could do to protect themselves against the surprise of Easter and the surprising kingdom that Jesus was bringing. They tried to overpower him. The authorities tried to overpower Jesus. You saw they placed guards at the tomb of a dead man. I mean, what were they so afraid of? They placed guards at the tomb, and don't be mistaken, those guards were there to intimidate, to make people afraid. After they had already thought they'd overpower Jesus by force and political power, by physical violence, they tried once again posting these guards to overpower the surprise of Easter. But surprise, Jesus didn't come for their kind of power. He came to be the king of the powerless. They tried to outspend Jesus. If we had read just a few more verses in Matthew's gospel, we would have heard that they actually paid people off. They paid people to tell a different story about what the resurrection really was, to tell this tale about these desperate disciples who were so desperate that they went, they went grave digging. They tried to outspend Jesus. But surprise! Jesus came to be king for the poor. They tried to discredit Jesus. They tried to discredit Jesus, discrediting immediately the narrative of the disciples, undermining the disciples and his claims to be the Messiah. But surprise, Jesus didn't care about getting credit from them anyways. In fact, the first people to be witness to the disciples were women who were not considered a credible source at the time. Jesus never even tried to make a case for himself. They were determined not to be surprised by Jesus. And surprises are scary. Surprises can be really scary, even the best surprises. When I first found out that we were pregnant with our first child, uh, it had been a couple days I suspected that maybe... Uh, Tim was a grad student at the time. I didn't want to stress him out, so I waited until there was a day that I knew he was going to take the early morning train to his classes in Chicago, and he wouldn't get home until late that night. And so he took off on the train. I went and got one of those tests. Surprise! Two blue lines! And so then I went out and got some stuff to tell Tim, like to have some kind of fun way to tell Tim, guess what? You're going to be a dad. And so I went out and got this little plant pot. And, and uh, I got some potting soil and a baby rattle and made it look like the rattle was growing in the plant pot, right? <laughs> ah, I, I didn't even have like Etsy or anything at the time. I just came up with that. No TikTok. Man, how did we do cool things? Um, and, and I got some markers and I wrote on the side of the pot, love grows more love, which was the lyrics of one of our favorite bands at the time. I was so excited, so I took the train uh, to his classes, which was just kind of north of the city. Or no, no, he had taken the train, so I drove to surprise him and to meet him at the end of his classes, and I was going to drive him back home. And so I, I showed up, what are you doing here? It's like, I want to take you to pie and coffee. So we went to Baker Square. Does anybody remember Baker Square? We went to Baker Square because we are the oldest millennials you've ever met. And we sat down to pie and coffee, and I got out this little potted plant, and I put it on the table, and I pushed it over towards him. He starts looking at the potted plant, and suddenly understanding dawns over his face, followed by fear, <laughs> which I had expected, and so I waited a little while, and I thought that eventually he would smile or laugh, or hug me, or something. 
But pretty much the rest of our time there, he sat there staring at that potted plant, asking, are you sure? <laughs> How blue was the line? <laughs> What's the percentage of accuracy of these tests? I mean, just like question after question. Five <laughs> you, we'll make it 10, we'll make it 10. Oh, surprises are scary. Even the best surprises. Even the surprises that bring great joy. Sometimes, because of the fear, we end up missing out on the great joy. And I don't know about you, but right now, in this moment of time, there's a lot of fear. Read an author recently who basically made a claim that this generation, that we're this moment that we're living in is marked by fear and anxiety more than anything else. I don't know about you, but in this moment of time, I am tired of being afraid. I am deeply tired of being afraid. I am tired of carrying fear around in my body, in my bones, in my soul. I am tired of being afraid for my children, for my family, for my sisters, for our city, for my vulnerable friends and neighbors. I am tired of being afraid about the next tornado or the next election or the next invasion or the next Sandy Hook or Parkside or Uvalde or Covenant. I am tired of being afraid all the time. The soldiers were placed at the tomb to make people afraid. That's why they were there to make people afraid so that they would show up at that tomb, those foolish disciples, they would show up at that tomb and they would be too intimidated to do anything about a bad situation. Those soldiers were there to make people so afraid that they didn't dare hope for something better. The women who went to that tomb that day were probably really tired of being afraid. They were living in an occupied land where they had no control or say over whether soldiers might just show up at their house one day and demand to stay in their home and eat their food whether or not they could afford it. They had no ability to control so much of what happened in their lives or the future of their children. And if someone were to wrong them, if someone were to violate them, the word of a woman was not permissible as a witness in a trial. They were overpowered, outspent, discredited, without even a chance to ask for it to be made right. But then one day, these women met Jesus. They met Jesus, and he dared to speak to these women, to listen to these women, to welcome women as his disciples. And it was as if he had been there in the very beginning when God created them in the divine image. They were there that day on the mount, even if nobody counted them in the record. They were there on the mountaintop that day when Jesus was preaching and teaching, preaching, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And to those women, it probably sounded like, hey, anyone in here poor in spirit? Surprise, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Anybody here today mourning? Surprise, you get to be comforted. Hey, anybody here meek, like really meek, like you get treated like a doormat on the regular? Surprise, you get to inherit the earth. It's like the best day to get tickets to be an Oprah's audience. He's just giving stuff out to all the wrong people. 
And those poor in spirit women, they were now inheritors of the kingdom of heaven. And they had found their savior, someone who was for them and with them. And they followed him and they fed him and he fed them. And even at one time when one of them dared to leave the kitchen and come and join the men at Jesus' feet, she wasn't scolded, she was commended. So it's no wonder that when everyone else deserted Jesus, the women were the last ones at the foot of the cross, watching in fear and despair. As Jesus was crucified by the same powers that had been overpowering, outspending, and discrediting them their whole lives. And it's no wonder the women were the first ones at the tomb. When it was still dark outside, like scary dark outside, the women were the first ones at the tomb. I wonder what it was like when they got to the tomb to treat Jesus' bodies and they saw those Roman soldiers there. The same soldiers that had put him up on the cross. I wonder what it was like when they saw those soldiers who were so clearly put there to make them afraid. Obviously put there to intimidate them so that they wouldn't hope for something better. I wonder if they were so tired of being afraid. I wonder if one Mary turned to the other and said, hold my earring. Like, I wonder if they were so tired of being afraid. Walking up to that grave, clutching that basket like they were about to break it into pieces. I wonder if when the earth started to shake, they didn't know that that was the ground because the trembling was deep in their chest long before the earthquake. I wonder what it was like when the women walked to the tomb that morning. They get there and the soldiers who were there to intimidate them, the soldiers who were there to make them afraid... They feel the earth shake and they see an angel and those soldiers who were there to make them afraid are scared to death. Like they look like dead men, scripture tells us. But the women who they came to intimidate stood their ground and they heard the best news that the world has ever received. The best news that these women could have hoped to hear the angel says to them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You don't have to be afraid anymore because Jesus, who is with you and for you, who is giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, who sees you and knows you and loves you, Jesus, who was crucified by those same Roman guards who are passed out over in the corner, he is not here. He is raised, raised to new life. He has been resurrected. Come on, women, come and see for yourselves. And then go and take this message. In other words, the angel is saying to them, nobody else might find you credible, but we find you credible. You are a credible witness. Justice has come. Righteousness has prevailed. And you don't have to hide in fear anymore. So take the good news to the rest of the disciples. The passage that was read for us at the very beginning of this service today, that was from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 written by the Apostle Paul. It was from the message, so it might have sounded a little bit different, but it was written by the Apostle Paul, and you might have noticed that the Apostle Paul, he mentions Jesus appearing to Peter and James and the rest of the disciples. He doesn't mention anything about the women. And scholars would say that the reason he doesn't mention anything about the women is because he's trying to lay out a credible case for the resurrection. And women were not credible witnesses Y'all understand that God cared more about these women than getting credit for the resurrection of Jesus. God cared for them. And the women carried that message with a little bit of fear and with great joy. They carried that message. But before they even made it to the disciples, Jesus surprises them again, meets them on the road, and guess what Jesus says to them? Don't be afraid. 
Jesus says, do not be afraid. Jesus is truly surprising. You see, the resurrection of Jesus is good news for people who are tired of being afraid, who have been overpowered, outspent, and discredited. For people like you and me who carry fear in our bones, the kingdom of heaven is for you. Jesus is for you and with you. He has come to save you and empower you to be children of God, inheritors of this new kingdom that doesn't operate like the kingdoms of this world, that doesn't use power against the powerless, that doesn't care how many zeros are on your paycheck or your welfare check or your social security check. It doesn't try to silence the voices of people who are on the fringes but a kingdom that recklessly spreads blessing, that shares authority with the children of God, that feasts with the poor and listens to the cries of the oppressed. This is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I also have to say this morning, if you are one of those who are in the business of overpowering, outspending, and discrediting, You might be a little afraid today. (sighs) Hey, but I'm a little afraid too. I'm a little bit afraid of Jesus too. I'm a little bit afraid of when he calls me out. When he sees me where I am and I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I'm a little bit afraid of when Jesus calls me out and turns me around. I'm a little bit afraid of this thing that we sometimes in the church world call conviction. You see, conviction is when God's spirit speaks to my spirit and says, child of God, you were not created for this. That's conviction. Maybe you're a little bit afraid. A little bit afraid of a journey that will take you places that you didn't expect a journey with outcomes that you did not orchestrate. It's scary. I understand. I really understand. It's a little bit scary, but it comes with great joy. And I pray that you don't let the fear of conviction keep you from missing the great joy of life with Jesus. And if you'll let him surprise you, he'll amaze you. If you don't know much about Jesus this morning, this is all new to you, I get that it can be a little bit scary, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to hope for something better. Don't be afraid to hope for something better in your life, that God can change your life. Don't be afraid to hope that God can make all things new. Don't be afraid to hope that wherever you are this morning, whatever your circumstances you are facing, that God cares about you more than God cares about getting credit for Easter. I don't know what you're afraid of today. I don't know what fear you walked in carrying with you. The fear that is still rattling in your bones. Fear of sickness. Fear for your marriage. Fear of your singleness. Fear for your children or your grandchildren. Fear for your job or lack thereof. Fear for our city. Fear for our safety, fear for our country or for our planet. The resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of all things being made new. And there is no fear that resurrection does not confront. See, in the resurrection of Jesus, we have power to confront every fear and boldness to carry a message of great joy that cannot be overpowered or outspent or discredited. Amen? I mean, this is one of the amazing things about the story of resurrection. When Jesus says, do not be afraid, he's not saying, hey, don't be afraid and just forget about it. He's not saying, don't be afraid, let's let's just not worry about it. This is not a message of, uh, you know, let's just try to be in a state of zen no matter what's happening in the world around us. No, he's saying, don't be afraid. And here's your message to go and do something about it. 
that we live in this resurrection power, that we are empowered and emboldened to carry a message of hope that speaks back to the forces of darkness and evil in this world, a message of hope that pushes back in the face of fears, a message of hope that's been given in the power of the resurrection of Jesus that cannot be stopped by sin and death, no matter what. You have been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You have been called a child of God, invited to be heirs to the throne, and you've been given boldness. You've been given boldness to ask that God's kingdom would come and God's will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. That means we have every right to look around at the stuff that makes us afraid and to hope for something better. We have every right. We're children of God. You're a child of God. Now, that also doesn't mean that we get to orchestrate, control, and manipulate the way the rest of the world runs and operates. It just means we don't have to be defeated by it because we have a king who is undefeated. We have a king who went to the cross, who came not seeking power, not seeking money, not seeking fame or glory, but to do the will of the Father. This morning, we just want to give you an opportunity. If you'd like to come and pray. I just, I felt this so deeply in my bones this week, reading this word about fear and great joy and the tension that you are probably living in today. The tension of this Easter Sunday morning. If you'd like to come and to find a place of prayer to just be honest with God about your fears. Spiritual fears, maybe, about not being sure whether or not you can give your life to Jesus and follow him. Fears about sickness, fears about relationship, fears about what happens next. In fact, if you'd like, there's going to be pastors on the far side of either altars, on either side of the sanctuary. If you just need somebody to pray with you today, a pastor who you can say, will you pray about this? This is what's going on in my life today. There's somebody that's here to pray for you. But if you would just like a place on your own without anybody messing with you or bothering you, these these middle altars here, that's just for you, where you can come and tell the Lord what you need to tell, where you can come and speak those fears, speak them out loud, trusting that God will hold them. God will be near to you even in those fears. There's resurrection power for you to speak back to the forces that make you afraid. So if you'd like to come today and find a place at one of these altars, Pastor Jordan is gonna lead us in a song. We're gonna sing the words, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am not imprisoned or chained up by fear any longer. And maybe for the first time today, you just need to say that you're ready to be a follower of Jesus. You've been a little bit afraid. Maybe you heard about it. You were invited this morning. Maybe you're even just tuning in online to see what this is all about. But you'd like to become a follower of Jesus. Can I say, do not be afraid to hope for something better. Don't let fear stand in the way of great joy. Whatever God has on your heart today, whatever fear you are carrying, if you would like a place of peace to come and to pray and to offer that, this is your moment. So would you come and find a place where you can pray today as these words to this song become our response speaking back to the fear of this world.